Uh, the reward for suffering through me is now you get to hear Tobias. Okay, Tobias Smith. And Tobias has experience in China looking at, looking at legal questions. He uh, earned a law degree uh, and didn't go off to make a million dollars representing Alibaba or some other firm. He decided instead to uh, continue in school and to earn a PhD, and he's earning that at Berkeley. He has already published on questions such as life without parole, uh, a new punishment that's been created specifically for people convicted of, of corruption. And he is a really talented speaker, a distinguished teacher even at his young age. He was recognized by Berkeley with a teaching award and it's our privilege here at the 1990 Institute to bring him to this microphone. Won't you welcome him? First of all, thank you, Clay, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and thank you to everyone at the 1990 Institute for inviting me today. Uh, I'm particularly excited because uh, I actually am an example of a high school student whose life was changed by China. I moved to China with my parents, who were educators, uh, when I was 17. It was their first time in China and mine. And here, two decades later, I'm still studying China. I came to China first and the law second. Um, I've been asked to talk about the law today. Um, I recognize that the law can be a dry topic. Uh, I, I was a little anxious to say that I was talking about the law because I know uh, that um, it's hard enough for adults to think about the law, let alone high school students, right? I mean, we don't even go to law school until after college, and it's a lot of codes and rules and books, and how do we make it engaging? So the first thing I want to say today is that as Americans, when we talk about the law, we're actually talking about a lot more than these heavy tomes, right? So first, we're talking about our founding principles, right? Our constitutional convention, right? We're a country founded on law with the idea of law at the center of who we are. So I imagine that if you're teaching civics, social studies, history, uh, Ken, I talked to Ken, he was teaching government next semester, next, next year. Um, you'll be talking about these ideas. And so China offers a counterpoint to our American stories about our founding identity. Also our day-to-day -day life, right? Everybody drove here. You all stopped at a traffic light. You probably didn't think to yourself, I'm obeying the law. But we live in a country ruled by law and we're constantly making choices based on those conditions. We're swimming in it. It's the water we live in, right? So law is all around us, of course. It's also on television, uh, legal procedurals. Uh, many of you maybe go home at night and watch Law and Order. Uh, it's on television, it's in the movies, uh, it's in our entertainment, and of course it's in our contemporary politics too, right? Uh, your students may be thinking about Me Too, about Black Lives Matter, right? This, these are deeply connected to questions of law. Is American law fair? Who is it fair for? Do we want to change it? Right? So if these are questions you're having with your students, China may be a good place to do some comparison, to think about our own assumptions. And that's what I hope to do today when I talk to you about law in China. So I need to start with a little history. Devin pointed out that history is always in the background, even if we're talking about China now. And Clay gave us some background going back to 1974 to the height of the Cultural Revolution. So China has a really long history, right? And it has a long history of law. There was law in Imperial China. There was an extensive criminal code. I can tell you lots about that. I could tell you lots about law in Republican China in the early 20th century. I could tell you about law in early Communist China. There's plenty to talk about. But instead, I'm going to start here at the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976. Cultural Revolution, that's Mao's last hurrah, right? And I'm starting there because it's often considered a year zero for law in contemporary China. And I'll talk a little more about why, but all of my talk is going to be focused on 1976 on, or really 1979 on. Okay, so I have three goals today. First, 
I want to tell you two different stories about law in China. And I think when I tell you these stories, you may feel like you've been a schizophrenic for a lot of years <laughs> and you haven't realized it. And so I'm going to point out the two, the two halves of your brain for the schizophrenia. So the first part is a story of rapid convergence. This is about how China, in the last generation, generation and a half, has developed law and come to look a lot like the US and like the Western world. It's come to look like us. So earlier we heard from Qin Qin, and she's a lawyer, right? And she said that she went to law school. She's a civil litigator. Um, she's in a firm. She's a partner, right? Those are very, very American words. I didn't see anyone bat an eye. A generation ago, this would have been unheard of, right? But now we can understand this identity for her as a lawyer, right? As a lawyer dealing with lawsuits. Um, it doesn't seem weird to us. So that's a story of convergence, of rapid convergence, having to do with China's rise. We have a second story, persistent difference. This is the, the, the dark half of the story, or the, the maybe more pessimistic story. And this is when you turn on the news and you hear about the persecution of dissidents, the disbarment of lawyers. You hear about these things that sound so far away, so anathema to our idea of law, to our idea of American law, right? Or you hear about the one-child policy, or you talk about the HUCO system, right? Two of the three pillars of understanding uh, China today, as Clay put it. These are both legal institutions, right? How is it that a country has a legal system that effectively has internal passports? How is it that it tells its citizens how many kids they can have? That seems really different. So we've got these two stories. How do we put them together? How do we make sense of them? Is it that one of them's wrong? No, I don't think so. We just, we have to synthesize to put these two stories together in our heads. We have to figure out how we're not going to be schizophrenics anymore. And then last, how are we going to teach these stories? How are we going to talk to our students about them, right? So as I said, I don't think high school students are very keyed into the law. And so they're not keyed in now to China and they're not keyed into the law. Then we have a double duty to figure out how to teach them this stuff. So I have some suggestions and that's what I'll close with. So let me start with this first, this first point, this two stories of law. Rapid convergence, right? This is a story about China's rise in a few decades and how it's come to look a lot like us. It starts in the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution runs from 1966 to 1976. It's sort of the last moment of radical Maoism. Here we have um, a painting from the time called Bombard the Capitalist Headquarters. The Capitalist Headquarters is the government. This is the government calling for the overthrow of itself, right? This is a period when the mouthpiece of the government, right, the People's Daily, publishes an editorial called In Praise of Lawlessness. This is legal nihilism, right? We're going to obliterate every vestige of the law, of capitalist law, of bourgeois law. We're going to tear it to the ground. And they did. They did so successfully. So this continued until Mao's death in 76, and then there are a few years of turmoil, and then this man comes to power, Deng Xiaoping. We've had him mentioned, I think, in every one of the talks. Um, I've been told that Xi Jinping uh, communes with him from his grave. Uh, <laughs> important figure. He only in talks to him, he doesn't listen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so very important figure in Chinese history, and he's known for two things. And the first thing that he's known for is engineering China's rise. China's economic miracle, right? Double digit growth year on year for decades. How is it that China has come to be this world economic power, this world political power? So it's this guy opening up China's markets. Well, how are you going to do that? How are you going to convince Western companies to go invest in China if they're worried about their, you know, their bourgeois law being undermined and their, their property being expropriated? It's not going to work. So he made an active effort to rebuild China's legal system. And that's what's happened. There's been a recreation of these institutions. So let me give you some numbers, right? So China has a constitution. It's actually had many constitutions, and I'll talk a little more about, about its constitutions. But it put out a new constitution in 82, right? So 
setting new goals for its country and its laws. Courts. China has a lot of courts. It has about 3,000 lower courts. Okay? Those are like, um, like your city level court. Below that, it's got almost 10,000 tribunals. If you go up from there, from the lower courts, you get intermediate courts. There are 400 of those. And then every province has a high court. It's like a state court. And at the very top of that, you have the Supreme People's Court. So lots of actual legal places, right, where you could go and watch a hearing. Judges, 200,000 judges. More judges per capita than, uh, I believe, in the US. I saw a hand, did I see it? Yeah, do you want questions throughout or after? I'll take them at the end, that would be great. Lots of judges, right? You need judges if you're gonna have a functioning legal system. Lawyers. So at the end of the Cultural Revolution, China basically had no lawyers. I mean, we're talking a thousand lawyers in the entire country, right? There was no one like Qin Qin. Now we have 300,000 lawyers. That may not seem like a lot, but in a generation, that's quite an undertaking to mint this many lawyers, right? And of course, to do that, you need law schools. All the law schools were closed during the Cultural Revolution. There were less than 15 at the end of the Cultural Revolution. Now, this is the number from 2010, I'm sure there are more. We have hundreds of law schools. So we have all this stuff of law, these institutions, right? Laws, legal codes. Um, I study criminal law, I study capital punishment in China. At the end of the Cultural Revolution, there was no criminal law. There was no actual criminal code. You couldn't actually look to a single document to know what the law was. First criminal law in China was propagated in 1979. Now we have hundreds of laws. We have laws on food safety. We have laws on traditional Chinese medicine, on terrorism. We have laws on, on, on the internet. We have all sorts of regulation based in legal codes. And then we have cases. People are going to court. They're suing each other. They're suing the government. They're being arrested. There's lots and lots of actual court activity. So there's this stereotype that China doesn't have law, that Chinese people don't embrace law. And that's just, that's not true anymore. It's a part of daily life. This is just a, a traffic tribunal, a picture I found on the internet. But you can imagine, right? You get in a car accident, what do you do? You actually, you know, you go to court, you, you hash it out. There are uh, hundreds of thousands of civil suits every year against the government. Imagine that. You can have an administrative suit against the state. People win. They say, you know, my land was taken away. My, my water was poisoned. I'm suing the government. You can do that. There are labor disputes, right? Uh, we've talked all about, about phone manufacturing, right? You could sue your employer. You could say labor law is not being followed. Hundreds of thousands of cases every year. So it's a part of people's lives, just like here. It's in the popular media. This is a show called Executive Judge, I think, Jersing Fa Guan. Um, I haven't seen it, but you know, it looks a little like Law and Order. You can see where they got the, the, the image from, right? You've got cops, you've got uh, prosecutors there. Um, people watch this stuff. One of the most popular shows on television in the last few years has been a show about prosecuting corrupt officials. Incredibly popular. People love to watch it. And moving forward, Xi Jinping has said that he's committed to law. He has stated that he wants to continue to develop China's legal system. Uh, this is a picture of uh, a new online database uh, started in 2013. Theoretically, all court cases, in fact, all legal documents from court adjudication throughout China, throughout those 10,000 courts that I talked about, are supposed to be on here. Now, it's not complete, and I'll talk about some of those problems, but when I checked it, this is a few months old that I took this shot, but there are 40, or, there it is, 40 some million cases. It's the largest database of legal cases in the world, right? The US doesn't have a database like that. We have LexisNexis, it's private. We don't have a national system. So in some ways, China is moving even beyond us. So this is a story of convergence and optimism. But there's another story, and that's a story of divide. So these women uh, are family members of lawyers who were swept up in a crackdown called the 709 crackdown that happened in 2015. Uh, civil rights lawyers who were doing totally legal, nonviolent things were persecuted. Hundreds of them were gathered up, disappeared, 
some of them are still missing. And these women are protesting peacefully, and they have messages written in red um, as a form of protest. So we hear about this whenever we look at the newspaper these days, right? We hear about um, dissent and the crackdown of dissent in China. Let's go back again to the end of the Cultural Revolution. Deng, first famous for engineering China's economic rise. Second, famous for being the, the person in charge during the Tiananmen Square crackdowns in 1989. So China's going to chart a course towards law, but there's going to be a limit. Political dissent, particularly political dissent against the party state, is not going to be tolerated. Right? We're going to use the military, if necessary, to crack down on the dissent of college students who are peacefully calling for democracy. So that's the second story of Deng. So um, as was mentioned, the 1990 Institute comes out of a US attempt to, to figure out how to engage with China after this event. What do we do as Americans? I mean, it's an assumption that we should do anything. But we did, we do. So that's Nancy Pelosi uh, many years ago, uh, immediately after Tiananmen. She goes to Beijing and she unfurls a banner in solidarity with uh, those who died in Tiananmen Square. There were basically two responses from the US, from the US polity. Some people wanted to crack down on China really hard. We have to stop this behavior. Another group said, look, let's let China rise economically first. Let's let it develop this rule of law system that, we've, that I mentioned that Deng is pushing forward, these courts, these institutions. And democracy will come. Civil liberties will come. Once we have a middle class, that middle class is going to want the same things we want. That was the argument. And that argument won the day. So that's why in 2001, China entered the WTO because ultimately the belief was that China's economic prosperity will lead towards this convergence, this legal convergence. That hasn't happened. Um, those predictions, th those predictions of, of convergence, um, they either came too early or they're just wrong. Because in some ways, despite Xi Jinping's con commitment to the growth of law, we've actually seen more of a crackdown on dissent in the last few years. So you all, I'm sure, can think of a thousand examples of this just from reading the news newspaper. Because every third story about China is a story about some aspect of crackdown on dissent. I'll just mention three. So the first is crackdown on 709 lawyers. It's called 709 because it was July 9th that there was this sweeping arrest. Hundreds of, of lawyers were, were arrested. Some of them were disappeared. Many of them uh, disappeared for quite a long time. Some of them have yet to been released. And these were not lawyers who were, who were violent. These were, in most cases, not lawyers who were even outside the bounds of law. Some of them didn't even know that the things that they were doing were going to be seen as controversial. But they had crossed some line, and the state made that clear, despite the fact that they're lawyers, that they're, that they're the vanguard of the law. A second example. So this is uh, Liu Xia. She's holding Liu Xiaobo's picture. You probably are familiar with Liu Xiaobo because he won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for his work on Charter 08, which was a public call for increased democracy and rule of law in China. In other words, he was calling for China to embrace Western values around the law. He was imprisoned for that document. He was sentenced to 11 years in prison for inciting subversion. And a little more than a year ago, he died. He had uh, came down with uh, liver cancer and passed away shortly thereafter. Uh, so this is his wife holding up a picture of him after his death. She was kept under house arrest for seven years um, under dubious legal circumstances. She was actually just given some freedom. It's supposedly Angela Merkel, the Germans pushed behind the scenes, and there's been a loosening of treatment for her. But again, an example of a dissenter uh, calling for certain kinds of political change who's been um, treated harshly by the Chinese legal system. And I'll give one third example. This is about Hong Kong. Hong Kong is an interesting case, right? Because Hong Kong was handed from the British back to the Chinese in 1997. And it will eventually be entirely incorporated back within China. 
But for the first 50 years, it's under the one country, two systems plan. So it has its own basic law and effectively its own rule of law system that's semi-autonomous from China. Uh, in the last few years, many Hong Kong citizens have felt that China has begun to encroach upon that independence. And so in 2014, there was a movement called the Umbrella Movement or Occupy Central. So if, if Occupy sounds like a familiar term, it's because it comes from the same idea as Occupy Wall Street. Young people took to the streets to protest mainland China's intervention in their elections. And I put up this example because it was led by young people. So this is Joshua Wong. He's one of the leaders of this movement. I think he was 15 when he started becoming engaged in this process. And the leaders of the movement were all high school students and college students, and they ended up running for office, actually. Uh, one of them became the youngest elected member of the legislature in Hong Kong's history, 23 years old. They also all faced legal punishment for their actions. Ultimately, all of the leaders were um, arrested for basically um, inciting a demonstration, and they've been given short prison sentences. So the Chinese state does punish certain kinds of dissent that we might think are anathema to our understanding of rule of law. So we've got these two stories, right? And if you're like me, it feels a little schizophrenic. I don't understand how to put these two together. How do we make sense of it? I'm going to suggest that the way to make sense of it is to think that China believes that it's developing a China model of law. Now, it's an open question for you, I put this to everyone, whether there can be something as an individual case of a model of law. But I think this is what China sees itself as doing. There's no single document that will claim what is the China model of law. But let me give you some examples. So, rights. China's law does protect certain kinds of rights, but it emphasizes different rights than the rights that are emphasized here in the US. So those are economic and social rights. And that's how you can have a system like the HUCO, the, um, the household registration system, or the one-child policy because there's a, there is also a belief in China that you have a right to economic growth, to security and stability, and that the state can take great, can go to great ends for those kinds of collective goals. You see less emphasis on civil liberties, right? On the kinds of rights that we enshrine in our Bill of Rights, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, right? Those are not as protected, both as a matter of law and as a matter of practice in China. Different emphasis. You think about, take an issue like gun control, right? For us, we think about gun control in the Second Amendment as being an individual right that's protected. But there's a counter argument, which is that safety is a collective right, and the law should protect individuals collectively, right? And so that might call for a restriction on guns. So, there are rights in the Chinese model of law, but they might be different than the rights that you and I think about and that your students think about. Uh, gun control actually might be a particularly good one to talk about given recent school shootings. What do your students think about this as a right? Justice, fairness, uh, independence of the courts. The China model of law also promises these things, but it looks different than in the US. So in the US, the courts are a co-equal branch of government they're independent, right? Our Supreme Court has the right to interpret the Constitution, has the last say in it. It's not true in China. In China, it's the National People's Congress that ultimately interprets the law. So the courts aren't independent in their interpretation of the law. But I don't think that means they're not independent, right? A China model of law does say that your courts are going to be independent from the extraneous influences of corruption, uh, from personal relationships. Now, does this happen in practice? No, it's still a developing system. But the idea is that even if the courts aren't independent from your political goals as a country, that doesn't mean that if you get into a traffic accident, you know, out here as you're driving into San Mateo, that you can't go to a traffic court and get a fair hearing. That if you and your neighbor have a suit over property, that you won't get a fair hearing. So the China model of law does, I believe, um, 
does exemplify a certain vision of independent courts. Finally, sovereignty. So we talked about Hong Kong. If you want, we can talk about Tibet and Xinjiang, Taiwan. The China model of law exerts a really strong control on domains that are seen as within China's sovereign borders, which is why Hong Kong and Taiwan are such sensitive issues. China sees them as part of, of China, and what's a part of China is under China's purview legally, according to this model. I think the China model of law doesn't have much to say about law outside of China. I don't think that the Chinese state is very interested in telling the US how we should run our legal system, or Sudan, or Italy. I think that it's a, it's a model of law that believes that different countries can have different values. So this is what I think is going on, and this is how we make sense of these two hemispheres. OK. Where do we go from here? You can, you can ask, and I think it's a reasonably open question, whether the Chinese people support this model of law. How do we know, right, if it's a country that limits dissent? Tough question. But I'm going to go where Clay went, which is I'm going to look at the Pew, Pew Research Center. I think these are the best polls we have. I think polling data is useful, even if it's in um, illiberal regimes. And here you can see the Pew poll asked recently, it asked Chinese citizens whether they think, think things are going to get better, stay the same, or get worse. And you'll see the questions they ask are all questions related to law, right? Corruption, it's a legally related question. Safety of food, air pollution, water pollution, the law regulates these things. And most Chinese people think that things are going to get better. They think that things are working. They have faith in this system, at least as a matter of polling. And then one final poll. This is another perennial favorite to look at. So the Pew Center does some basic polls, and it asks people all over the world whether they think their kids are going to have a better life than they did. Right? Are they going to be economically better off? And consistently, Americans, for many years now, have said, a majority of them said, no, our kids aren't going to be better off. In China, consistently, about 80% of people say yes. They're optimistic about the future of their country. Of course, this goes beyond law. This goes to economics. It goes to all sorts of things. But law is a part of it. There seems to be some buy-in about the political vision for this country. So I would encourage you to think about how you can talk to your students about these kinds of um, responses and what they mean for thinking about our country and China. Finally, how are you going to teach this material, right? This is pretty dense. I've been thinking about it for over a decade, and it's, I still struggle with it. You've heard me talk for a half an hour, and I'm sure you're struggling with it. How are your students going to learn about it? How are you going to teach them? So I have a few initial suggestions. You could ask them whether they think rights are culturally universal or culturally relative, right? So what rights do they think they enjoy here in the US, and why? Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. What about the right to have a job, the right to clean air, the right to not be shot in your school? What do they think? Do other countries enjoy these rights? And if so, is it because they're universal? Is it because they're somehow natural? In, inborn, or are they cultural values that different people can hold differently? If you're looking for a teaching tool, I suggest what I call the dueling reports. And I've um, given some handouts to Ruby, or I've got, sent her some electronic resources that contain links to these reports. Every year, the US, a, after, after Tiananmen, the, the Congress established uh, an executive commission on China. And they write a report every year. And it's always damning. Every year, it's a deeply depressing document that talks about how illiberal China is, and it talks about um, these, these rights that China is not honoring. And every year, China writes its own report. And it says, you say China doesn't have human rights? Look at the human rights in the US. Look at gender inequality. Look at racial inequality. You know, look at rates of poverty among African Americans. Aren't those human rights? How, you know, tend to your own house. It's effectively what's said. So you could look at these two reports. You could ask your students to look at them and think about which of these rights they think are important and why. Second question. You could ask them, what's a constitution, right? 
probably in many of your classes, constitutions come up, uh, whether it's history, the founding of America, civics. And we, we sometimes read our own constitution. We, we, uh, it's a relatively short document. I think we less often read the constitutions of other countries. And that's a shame. Because while lots of countries have constitutions, they don't all look the same. So what is a constitution? Why does a country have it? We see it as being um, the rock on which our law is founded. But not every country does. China has a constitution. It doesn't read like ours. It enumerates lots of goals and values, things that we wouldn't expect in a constitution. Environmental protection, right? Like it, it, it talks about things that seem beyond the scope of an American vision of a constitution. And it raises the question, what does a constitution do? England doesn't have a constitution at all. France has had lots of them. If you look at a couple different constitutions, your students may begin to use critical eyes to think about our own system. And then finally, I encourage you to use China as an example to think about dissent, and particularly illegal dissent, right? So we talk a lot in the US about the civil rights era, about nonviolent protests, Gandhi, Martin Luther King. And then today, right, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, uh, violent protest, Antifa, people taking to the streets, smashing windows. You know, that's, is that violent? Is that acceptable? How do we, how do we see this? this is, these are open questions, and I think really serious questions for young people. China offers a good example to think through some of this stuff. In particular, I think what happened in Hong Kong, Occupy Central and the Umbrella Movement, is a really crucial example for thinking through dissent, right? This is a, Hong Kong is a, is a country in between. It's, excuse me, it's a, it's, a, it's a jurisdiction in between, right? So it's part of China, but it also reflects certain Western values of law. How are the people of Hong Kong thinking through this struggle? There are some good uh, documentaries, both about the umbrella movement and about dissenters in China. You might think about excerpting some of that and showing it to your students alongside the conversations we're having about the US um, civil rights movement. So those are my three starting suggestions. I'm happy to talk more individually about the curriculum that you have and what you think uh, China could offer to it. Um, but I know we're short on time, so I'm going to stop there, and uh, we can talk more in small groups. Thanks, everyone. I'm jealous of his mastery of time. <laughs> so very, very jealous. No, this was a, a wonderful presentation, and it hit on such important things. Uh, so, for example, this example of the uh, dueling documents, uh, the State Department issues a document, and China always begins its document with the United States judges everybody else, it's time for somebody to judge the United States, and then highlights the number of homicides and all of those kinds of things. One, one question, in the Chinese Constitution, there's an article that trumps everything else, right, uh, about preserving, and now Xi Jinping's name is in the Constitution, so that's something new. But what is social order? And maybe you could say something about the question of preserving social order, because that's the be-all and end-all in China. Now more money is spent on internal security than on the Army, the Navy, all of that sort of thing, for social order. And so many of the lawyers who've been arrested have been arrested for quarreling or disrupting social order. Can you say something about the question of social order? Sure, I'd be happy to. So there are a couple ways to tell the story. So one way to tell the story is the way that I think many Chinese that I talk to tell it. And this has to do with China's long history, right? So this story is rooted in culture. And it says, look, China has thousands of years of history. And it's gone through periods of civil war that have been hundreds of years long. If you've gone through hundreds of years of civil war, then social order becomes very important. It becomes more important than other values, right? We know what it's like when, when there's famine, when there's war, and we are willing to go to great lengths. We are willing to support a state that restricts our rights in order to preserve that order. So that, that's one story, and that's a cultural story. Um, I think there's a more recent story, 
And that's the story that comes out of Tiananmen. Sometimes this is called the deal. Um, a fancy term for this is performance legitimacy. And that's the story that goes, all right, the Communist Party has been able to provide unprecedented economic opportunity, right? Double-digit economic growth, year on year. As long as it continues to do that, coming out of the relative poverty of mid-20th century China, again, we're willing to accept these things. It's not about the long history, it's about the immediate history. It's about remembering the starvation of, of, of our parents, right? And so that story, I think, is about how the party is going to stay in power in the short term. Can it continue to deliver? And if so, will that continue to hold its place as um, a state with the legitimate mandate to, um, to control dissent? Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. I think uh, <laughs> one, one quick point on that, on that subject. Uh, who gets to judge what is a threat? And so, for example, with regard to corruption, if you want to demand that officials reveal their bank accounts and things like that, that's a problem. You're going to go to jail. That scene is disruptive, that sort of thing. But people have, there have been surveys, Mary Gallagher at Michigan and others have done surveys, and they've interviewed people who have sued because the boss ran off with the money, the factory closed, they, they didn't get paid. And they took this to court. And many times they lose. But after they come out, they're interviewed and said, well, what do you think? I got a voice. I had a voice. And so there's some satisfaction with that. Uh, my own thinking is that, in fact, the legal system is the Communist Party's hope for staying in power by using the legal system as a way of creating that space to have, to have a voice. I don't know if you have a thought on that. I do. I have one follow-up. And this, again, gets back to long Chinese history, right? So it's hard not to, uh, is this a mic? I guess I'll just stand closer to this mic. Uh, it's hard sometimes uh, not to look back to China's long history. And one Chinese tradition that's very important is called remonstrance. So remonstrance is the duty to speak the truth to people in power. And historically, what this has meant is when you have had emperors who have not been doing their duty to the people, who have been corrupt, who have been not paying attention to the suffering of the people, it is the job of officials, it is the job of your bureaucrats, effectively your imperial lawyers, basically, to tell the emperor. And you know what happens? Often those people are put to death. It doesn't work out for the person who remonstrates. But it's still a Chinese value. You are still supposed to do it. It is the right thing. And ultimately, even if you are put to death, the state may change. So what happens with many of these lawyers who are picked up is they get arrested. So you know, one good example is there are some lawyers in Beijing who have fought about, around this hukou system to try to get um, young people who have moved to Beijing with their parents, because their parents are migrant workers, and they want to go to school. And they can't get into school because they don't have the right hukou. And so there have been legal efforts to fight this. And the lawyers who have fought this, they've been personally punished, and they've been sanctioned, and they've, you know, uh, their lives have been hard as a result. But the system has ultimately loosened. So it doesn't mean that they are not agents of change. And that's a tough one, right? What do we make of a state that says that this behavior is unacceptable and then embraces it sometimes? Um, I think we, sh we shouldn't discount the effectiveness of these people and their importance for the state even when they're punished. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, a lot of examples uh, in Guangdong and elsewhere of uh, migrants who were un unfairly punished and extrajudicial, they were beaten to death, that sort of thing, where this has come up. And they become heroes or uh, points that people organize around. 